Hello everybody, welcome to the Nutri-Centre and thank you for coming on a rainy, stormy night. And I need to thank the Nutri-Centre for inviting me to talk and my talk tonight is going to be about endometriosis because it's International Endometriosis Week so we're broadcasting live to the nation and hopefully to the world if everybody's there and listening. So I'll go through all the history of endometriosis and the research and how we can help it with nutrition. So I'm Diane Shepperson Mills. I run the Endometriosis and Fertility Clinic, but I am the chair of Endometriosis She Trust UK. I trained in nutrition at Manchester University, and then I did an, an open university degree in education and psychology. I was ill then with endometriosis and I couldn't get well with conventional surgery and drugs. So I trained at the Institute for Optimum Nutrition after I got well from seeing a nutritional clinical ecologist in London. And then I did an MA in health education at the University of Brighton looking at fertility and nutrition. And at the moment I'm doing a very extended PhD looking at the effect of gluten on fertility. Um, so I'm a nutritional therapy consultant. That's my office phone number at home, 01323 846888. And you can get in touch with me, diane at endometriosis.co.uk. And my website's at endometriosis.co.uk and makingbabies.com. So Endometriosis She Trust UK is a registered charity, 176843. Our main office is in New Cross Hospital in Wolverhampton and our website is shetrust.org.uk and we're working towards a future when women's lives won't be blighted by endometriosis. We've been running for over 10 years. We have a trustee board and a medical panel, an advisory panel. So we would love you to join if you <coughs> go onto the website and download details. We are in the process this month, because it's Endometriosis Awareness Month, we're updating the website, putting a lot of, about 50 new leaflets up and putting some new information in there, new research. I have attended the World Endometriosis Congress since 1989. They're every two or three years. I was in Montpellier in France in September last year. I am chair of the Nutrition Special Interest Group, past chair, for the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, which is a gathering in America every year of about 15,000 gynaecologists. I'm a member of ESHRA, which is the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology. I'm a member of BANT, the British Association of Nutritional Therapy. I am a certified nutritional therapist with complementary and natural health care council under the Department of Health. I'm a member of the Nutritional Therapy Council. I'm a governor and fellow of the Institute of Optimum Nutrition. I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine and as I said, chair <coughs> of Endometriosis She Trust UK. So do join us. The more of us there are, the better because we have a larger voice to ask the right questions and you can talk to your MP for better treatment of endometriosis. We did have an all-party parliamentary group in 2005-2006 and I'll come on to the research that we did then but I had a lady at my clinic last week and she is in London in an endo group and eight out of ten of them in their group have been stopped their sickness benefit. They've told them they should be trying to go to work and these are women who can't really stand up for two weeks of the month and are having very heavy periods so it's almost impossible for them to work. So we need to talk to local hospitals and see if we can get some of the hospitals to be centres for endometriosis expertise, centres of excellence where we've got gynaecologists who are the best trained, 
who are used to dealing with endometriosis, who attend world conferences and will do the research. And many of women with endometriosis, not all, because some women don't have any pain, but many women are most days of their period, and some people are ovulation, and others are having pain every day. They are feeling wretched, they are just exhausted from the pain, and they are living a half-life, if you like. So, Sir William Osler said, we have to be quiet and listen to the patient, because she's trying to tell you what's wrong with her. And at the moment, we only have 10 minutes to tell the doctor all these myriad of symptoms that are happening to us. So you may have to go back several times, but then if you see the same doctor, you can get the message through. But if you're seeing a different doctor every time, it's very difficult for a doctor in 10 minutes to get the picture. But what the woman wants is a good quality of life, not a living death. I know about this because I spent three years of my life crawling on the floor. I couldn't stand, I couldn't sit, I spent time lying down or kneeling. So it's so important that we get the treatment from, for this disease correct. And the problem is, what is endometriosis? We don't know really what is causing it. Is it an autoimmune disease? Some research suggests that it is. A disease which proliferates in the presence of oestrogen. Many women with endometriosis have high oestrogen levels out of balance with the progesterone. And in fact, there is research I'll come on to later because the implants of endometriosis that are growing in the wrong place, i.e. not inside the womb, produce their own endometriosis. A disease of inflammation, certainly it's causing inflammation. You feel as though someone's cut the lid off your stomach, poured acid in, and the pain is horrendous. And everything's cramping, it's just dire. So we've got pain, and because of the pain, you're just worn out. You are fighting pain, some people every day, all day. Some people just at periods, some women have worse pain when they ovulate than at their period. It depends where the endometriosis is growing. We know from research that women with endo have high levels of prostaglandin PGE2. And I know from Michael saying to me that in the lab, he once got some on his hand and forgot and scratched his nose. And for the next three days, it was like red hot chili. So that in itself, swelling around in the peritoneal cavity, is going to trigger some pain. A disease that affects atopic allergic women. There is research showing that women with a family history of asthma, eczema, hay fever, they may be more inclined to have endometriosis. A disease which affects skin and membrane, certainly because that's where it's growing on epithelial layers. And it also seems to affect the digestive tract in many women. They complain of like irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea, watery diarrhea, constipation to the point of what I call bunny rabbit droppings, sometimes blood, but not runny blood, not cancerous type blood, but menstrual sticky type blood, and some mucus. And this, hooray, it worked. Sometimes this doesn't work. So you can see these red petechial patches, these growths of endometriosis, almost like a red blood blister that's producing prostaglandin, PGE2, and producing estrogen. And the main gold standard is to go in with a laser laparoscopy and burn these out. Some of them are just growing on the top of the skin, and those are easy to remove. Others may be like an iceberg, 
they're called deep infiltrating endometriosis and they can grow deep down. I've seen them in operations on videos. Go into the body and there's a little spot of endometriosis but they've palpated the area and they've taken out a lump of endometriosis the size of a man's fist that's growing under what looks like healthy tissue. So you can imagine the pain that you're in. I've had some people with lumps of endometriosis the size of a grapefruit growing inside their bowel. One girl I had had a cyst on her ovary, a blood-filled cyst. Most of them are between 2 to 10 centimetres. This little skinny girl had a cyst that was 45 centimetres in diameter, like the size of a five-month fetus. So we have major problems. It, it is not a disease you need. We want to literally wipe it off the face of the earth. 4,000 cases just from the American Endometriosis Association Research Registry from 1998. So the pain throughout the cycle was 95% of these 4,000 women. Fatigue, 87%. I rang up the ME Association, I thought I had ME, because you couldn't do anything. You had to plan a strategy to get to a kettle to make a cup of tea. Diarrhea at menstruation, 83%. Abdominal bloating, literally from under your bosom, you look about seven months pregnant. Distension, I call it distension, as though you've been blown up with a bicycle pump, 84%. Heavy irregular bleeding. 65%, dyspareunia, painful intercourse, 64%, so life isn't very fun, <laughs> nausea with your period, and sometimes not just nausea, but projectile vomiting, so we've got 64%, dizziness, headaches, where you're spaced out, is 63%, Low resistance to infection, you catch every bug that everybody coughs at you, is 43%. Infertility, 41%. Obviously, if you've got all these chemicals in the peritoneal fluid that should not be there, then they're going to have a biochemical effect on the egg and the sperm. And also, low-grade fever. Although some of the women, many women, have low body temperature, 36 degrees. The House of Commons data, we had 7,500 women, this was in 2006, who, from all over Europe really, answered a questionnaire that we devised with a group, a questionnaire, Mori-type poll people. The age at the first period pain, on average, was 16.3 years. But the age of diagnosis was 27.6 years. So on average, it was taking these women 9.11 years to get a diagnosis. And on average, it took them 5.11 years for their doctor in the UK to send them to a gynaecologist. In America, in Europe, you can just ring up a gynaecologist and go. But in Britain, we have a gate system whereby you've got to get a referral from your GP to get to the gynaecologist. I mean, this is dire, 10 years. And this isn't just here. We've had this research done in America, in New Zealand, in Australia, in Japan, and everywhere it's around 9 or 10 years. 15% of the women had to give up work due to their symptoms. I was one of them. I, I was teaching full time and I was <laughs> crawling on the floor so I couldn't teach. 68% were misdiagnosed with irritable bowel, cystitis, PID. So they were being given the wrong treatments. And 30% of the couples were subfertile due to their endometriosis damaging organs. And 20% of women in the UK have had a hysterectomy by the age of 55 years for endometriosis or other things. So David Adamson, who's in Palo Alto, California, 
His definition is endometriosis is an enigmatic inflammatory condition characterized by lesions of endometrial type tissue outside of the uterus in the presence of typical clinical symptoms of pelvic pain and infertility. It affects an estimated 176 million women of reproductive age worldwide. That's probably a conservative figure because we have many women misdiagnosed and many women without a diagnosis. The gold standard diagnosis would be a laparoscopic visualisation of these lesions, preferably with a histological confirmation, which means a biopsy, a sliver that you put under a microscope. But I know some of the gynaecologists in uh, America have sent four or five or six slivers from the same person to different labs and only two labs have picked it up. So if you haven't done a biopsy, the false positive rate with a laparoscopy visualisation on its own could be 50%. So you really, they're suggesting that you need to do both a laparoscopy with a vision and a biopsy because there is a thing called occult endometriosis which can't be seen with the naked eye, it's so microscopic. So we're trying to build centres of excellence. We're at the moment doing a consensus document with the World Endometriosis Society, looking at how, with cancer, if you have cancer diagnosed, <laughs> you're sent to a specialist centre. And that's what we feel we need with endometriosis. So we want expert teams of advanced surgeons who've undergone specific training specialised training in endometriosis and who agree to commit to research so that we have a bigger database of research and a multidisciplinary network of healthcare experts who are accredited and skilled to give an informed choice of all the treatment options because it's a minefield and what works with one person doesn't work with another because we're all unique. Sorry, there's a miss there. So endometriosis women usually require individualised treatment. My endometriosis was here. I had spots of endo, I had a huge cyst 10 centimetres on my left ovary which came up and down four times. But other people might have some here. Some people have it on the diaphragm. I've treated 21 women who had it in their lung. Some of them coughed up menstrual blood at a period. The first case in 1860 was in the eye and many women get their gums bleeding when they're having a period. So it can grow anywhere, generally inside the peritoneal cavity, but it is known to move outside. And obviously treatment priorities change as the severity of the disease develops over time. So you might have a treatment which causes it to die back and then you come off the treatment and then it grows again, not necessarily where it was. So you can be in and out like a yo-yo and symptoms can change as the different treatments progress. So the diagnosis and management should actually be primary health care. We would like it to be treated under primary health care. And in New Zealand, they've been looking at adolescent girls. This really worries us. Because the group of girls who display period pain, where the painkillers don't stop the pain, and taking the pill doesn't stop the pain, we feel that they need to be investigated for endometriosis. Deborah Bush, who runs the Endometriosis Association in New Zealand, works at the Oxford Clinic in Christchurch and she goes round schools and has done for many years teaching about period pain and endometriosis and the group of girls in New Zealand who are not responding to painkillers and the pill when they laparoscope that group 93% of that group of girls 
had stage 3 or 4 endometriosis at the age of 13, 14. So this is deadly serious. We need the right treatment. The prevalence in the female population, obviously of reproductive age, is said to be 8 to 10 percent of women and 20 to 50 percent of women with endo have fertility problems. The medical literature, when you do a, a big search, it says 6 percent up to 45 percent. We suggest there are around 1.6 to 2 million women in the UK alone. 70 million in the EU and 176 million worldwide. Now what on earth is causing this? All women have a womb. All women have got a monthly build-up of endometrium ready for a, a fertilized egg to implant in. If you're not going to have a pregnancy, that womb lining is shed as a period and comes out of the body. But we think, rather like a coffee percolator, that in some women you get retrograde flow. So instead of the blood going out of the womb, it comes up through the fallopian tube and drips into the peritoneal cavity. And when you watch videos of that happening, and they're slow motion and then speed it up. It takes four hours for the menstrual endometrial tissue to build its own blood supply in the organ that the blood splattered onto. So it only takes a few hours to seed itself onto another area like the bladder, the bowel, the ovary, the uterosacral ligaments and then it starts growing. So we have on film and we know that there is a possibility of retrograde menstruation. Malarian cell rest is when you're forming in your mother's womb as a fetus. We have malarian cell rest which are going to turn into girl bits, wounds and ovaries. And, and the boys have wolfarian cell rest which turn into bo the boy parts if you like. And they think that in the girls, it may be that some of these cell rests, which are supposed to be womb lining, may grow in the wrong place. We don't know why, but that is one theory. Immune system failure, because endo is a bit like cancer. It's a cell growing in the wrong place. And your white blood cells and B cells and T cells are going round the body mopping up the debris, saying, oh, this is a cancer cell, let's take it out. shouldn't be there if it's working properly. <clears throat> and it ought to be doing the same thing, did it, with endo cells, saying, why is this growing here, this shouldn't be here, let's remove it. So there may be some failure of the immune system. Salomic metaplasia is like cancer cells moving around the body through the bloodstream or the lymphatic stream so that you get the cancer growing somewhere which is removed but you get secondary cancer because it's passed through the blood or the lymphatic system so you get cancer growing elsewhere. The viral infection, a few <coughs> gynaecologists <coughs> wonder if it's a virus or a bacterial effect and failure of the endometrium. For some reason the endometrium not working properly. And then risk factors, <coughs> family history, early periods. A lot of the women I see, but not all, their periods start at 10 or 11 instead of 14, 15. And my grandmas and that generation, Edwardian, their periods started at 17. So it's getting younger and younger, which is bad. Um, lean BMI, skinny ribs when they're teenagers, Two, you know, m many of them are thin. DES exposure is an estrogenic <coughs> hormone-like substance which was given to pregnant women to stop them miscarrying and a lot of their daughters have developed endometriosis. Environmental exposure to pesticides and chemicals which are estrogenic like PCBs, dioxins, phthalates, bisphenol A. 
so don't let your children chew any plastic. Personal history of allergy, as we said, inflammatory disease in the family history, short menstrual cycles, pain and heavy bleeding, irritable bowel, and family history of thyroid disease. I know one of the doctors we used to work with many years ago, he used to come to our workshops two or three times a year, and we all used to queue up and give him some blood. And he found that all women with endo had autoantibodies to the thyroid, but then he retired and didn't write it up. So Stephen Kennedy's research at Oxford shows that endometriosis has been reported to be five to nine times more likely in individuals with families where there are already diagnosed cases. And the disease can be more severe and the symptoms then begin at an earlier age. And they think there may be a genetic link. Well, they, they now have some research to show that. So we always say with disease, with health, that prevention is better than cure. So we need to know what is endometriosis? Why is it growing? What are we really trying to cure? What are the trigger factors? We still don't know exactly. And I always start from the point that the body is not a disparate set of organs that you can compartmentalise. We can't just say that it's the womb and the ovaries. Endometriosis seems to be systemic. A lot of women I see have sore throats. And Debbie Metzger, who's one of the gynaecologists at Stanford, she thinks that that's because the white blood cells are mopping up all the debris from the endo around the body and taking it to the lymph nodes so that your throat's swollen because your white blood cells are waging a war on the debris. And we know body cells work together and have message receptors. And we have to look at the whole body because in endo a lot of different areas are affected. So I started looking at the diet impact the symptoms of the disease because I trained at Manchester University in a degree in nutrition so I wanted to get well other ways <laughs> so I've looked at that for the last 20 odd years so does what we eat affect endometriosis and pain and fertility and I have a book here which is shortly going up as an e-book so you have to watch <coughs> the website because we're just turning it into an e-book so it will be available soon as an e-book as well as a hard copy personally I'm a book person <laughs> I don't think I can sit at a screen too long so endometriosis the key to healing and fertility through nutrition Diane Shepperson Mills Michael Vernon and it's Thorson's it's part of HarperCollins so you can find that and I've done chapters on everything I'm going through so when I started, I thought, well, where do we start? And look at cancer, because research shows that 35% of all cancers are diet-related. And 71% of adults questioned believe that the most important thing that they can do to protect their health involves eating well. This is World Health Organization. So people already have an inkling that good food makes you feel better, which is wonderful. <laughs> and there is a truth here, because nutrients give life to all living things. It's really primary health care. You know, your hen or hormones and enzymes are made from the nutrients you eat. They're made from proteins and fats and oils. You've got the reproductive, digestive, immune and nervous systems all working together, passing hormonal messages to each other. So we've got to try and get this whole body working. And research into restricted calorie intake at the University of Pittsburgh showed that fasting for one day alone can change the suppression of luteinizing hormone. So the implication for slimmers is that even short-term deficiencies of nutrients can have a profound effect on the endocrine reproductive system. So if you're restricting nutrient intake to lose weight, you could be damaging your chance of becoming pregnant. So you need to 
lose the weight and then eat normally and get pregnant because all animals on planet earth get pregnant on a rising body weight in veterinary medicine no animal gets pregnant when it's losing weight and if you go to cultures like the Maasai they put all the girls who are going to get pregnant in a hut on the edge of the village and all the village feeds them and Queen Esther in the Bible was given a special diet for a year and in, veteran, in, <laughs> in animal husbandry the animals are given licks and special vitamins and minerals to help them improve their endocrine hormone system before they put them to get pregnant. So lots of fresh fruit. So randomized controlled trials we're trying to do looking at dietary intervention and this one was by Sesti. Looking after endometriosis surgery they gave people vitamins, minerals, salts, lactic ferments, fish oils and that appeared to be an effective alternative to hormone treatment associated with similar pelvic pain reduction and quality of life improvement. This is 2007-2009. In dysmenorrhea, in the absence of proven endometriosis, one small trial showed fish oil, omega-3 fatty acids, to be more effective than a placebo for pain relief. I've just realised they haven't clipped anything to me. Can you just go and check with them whether they should have? Um, dietary support for three months prior to any operation may well improve healing after surgery. And at Guy's Hospital in London and St Bart's, they give most patients extra vitamin C and zinc after an operation to speed up healing. So it is known that things do a support after operations. Other research looking at selected food intake and the risk of endometriosis, this was in 2004, dietary factors have been the focus of a growing number of endometriosis patient directed books and websites. And a hospital based Italian case controlled study of 504 women observed a statistically significant protective effect of green vegetables and fruit consumption and a significant risk of endometriosis with great red meat, greater red meat consumption. So grandma saying eat your greens was right and I'll explain why later. So limited evidence suggests B1 and B6 are beneficial and the use of magnesium shows some evidence. You see you can't patent vitamins and minerals so you can't make money from them. So the research isn't done. So dietary advice to women to eat healthy balance of nutrient dense foods should be regarded as primary health care for women with endometriosis. And I'm going to explain why as I go on. We're looking at McCann's and Widdison data from 1939 and 1991. In 1939, the carrots had 12 of magnesium in 1991, 3. So there's a 71% drop in the amount of magnesium. Similar 50%, 30%. So the food we're eating now has less minerals in it. The magnesium has an anaesthetizing effect on the central nervous system. It's calming, it relaxes muscles, and it works 300 enzymes in the body. So obviously it's needed. Adequate magnesium is an important preventive against miscarriage and painful contractions of the uterus muscle. This is human physiology. So magnesium, green leafy veg, fruits, nuts, seeds, making sure people are eating well. What fascinates me is this, 1936 for heaven's sake, the American Senate warning that the alarming fact is that food, fruits, vegetables and grains now being raised 
on millions of acres of land that no longer contains enough of certain minerals are starving us no matter how much of them we eat. No man of today can eat enough fruit and veg to supply his system with the minerals he requires for the perfect health. Now I had a lecture with Craig Sams of Green and Black Chocolate once and he grew up in Nebraska. And when he was little, Nebraska used to have eight metres of topsoil. Now it has 18 inches of topsoil. So because of these large farms with no hedges, a lot of the good soil is washing away and the nutrients with it. This is Professor Tim Lang, University College London. To obtain as much vitamin A from an orange as your grandmother absorbed from one orange, you now need to eat eight oranges. And the National Diet and Nutrition Survey, which was 1999, 84% weren't getting of women weren't getting enough folic acid. 74% were falling short on all nutrients in the diet, so that's three quarters. 80% decrease in people having omega-3 fatty acids from fish, because Britain was a nation of herring eaters. You dipped them in a bit of oatmeal and you grilled them or fried them. 50% more saturated fats are eaten than the recommended level. And 15% of women and 13% of men aren't eating their five fruit and veg every day. In Canada, they're saying eight now. So I like this one. I thought the barium meal was tastier than the cauliflower cheese. <laughs> Having had barium meal, I would agree. So trans fats, this is Stacey Missman's research. She is at Harvard School of Medicine. A large study found that trans fats, the hydrogenated oils, linked, are linked to an increased risk of endometriosis and that omega-3 rich foods are linked to a lower risk. So the bad fats are bad, the good fats are good. The women whose diets are rich in foods with omega-3, oily fish, walnuts, flax seed oil, hemp, nuts and seeds, green veg, might be less likely to develop endometriosis, while women whose diets are heavily laden with trans are more likely to develop the disease. So things like manufactured cakes, biscuits, pastry, confectionaries, puddings, desserts. This was from 120,000 US nurses between 25 to 42 years of age, not diagnosed with endometriosis at the beginning, were tracked over 12 years and those who developed endo were eating higher levels of trans fats in their diets. So it's all pointing, isn't it, to some things not good in our food. Vitamin E binding protein athamine is significantly altered in the peritoneal fluid of women with endometriosis. That's the fluid that bathes the womb, the ovaries, the bladder, the bowel. So 224 women in a case control studies, the affirmin levels were altered significantly in the peritoneal fluid in women with endo compared to the women who were disease free and it was correlated with their vitamin E levels and it showed that there was increased oxidative stress in the peritoneal cavity of women with endo. So green leafy veg, lovely avocados, extra virgin olive oil, nuts and seeds. We've got to go back to eating how grandma ate. Lots of fruit and veg when they couldn't afford much meat. They were using beans and pulses and vegetables to fill their 12 to 18 children, remember. So oxidative stress is implicated in the pathogenesis of infertility related to endometriosis. A positive association between advanced stage endo and increased serum levels of hyperperoxides suggest an increased production of reactive species of oxygen in women with endo at stage 3 and stage 4 and there were decreased levels of glutathione. So there's a lot of biochemical activity in the endometrial sorry, in the peritoneal fluid in the women with endometriosis. 
So the study identified oxidized lipoproteins as an additional source of pain for the women with endo, and they suggested the use of an antioxidant supplement, something with selenium A, C and E, but it needs to be yeast free. And other research shows that women with severe pain, infertility and endometriosis had raised levels of PG series 2 from arachidonic acid in the peritoneal fluid and this could be a trigger for the inflammation. So we've got this human body here, we've got the endocrine system which is scattered to the four winds. Most of the organs in the body are all together, <laughs> if you like. But you've got the pineal gland, hypothalamus, pituitary, thyroid, thymus, pancreas, adrenals, ovary or testes. And the only way the message gets from one to the other is a tiny amount of a hormone travelling through the bloodstream. And the pituitary gland is the conductor of the endocrine orchestra. It says ovary do this, thyroid do that. So it's telling the other organs what to do. And obviously if one of them starts failing, the others are going to struggle a bit. So you've got to try and get this message right. It's almost like the message in the trenches, send three and fourpence, we're going to advance. At the end of the trench, became send three and fourpence, we're going to a dance. And we want the hormonal message from the pituitary to the ovary to be right. And if you're eating trans fats and not good oils, do the trans fats not work in the same way and send the right message? So normal menstrual flow, this dear man, Miss Dr. Casimir Funk, isolated vitamin B1 in 1912 he showed that B-complex reduced the length of time from a woman's menstrual flow from five to six days to three to four days. He said menstruation came on completely without warning, no PMS, when the women took a B-complex. And the amount of blood lost when women have a period is noted to be two fluid ounces. I always say this is in books written by male gynaecologists <laughs> because some of us have soup bowls of blood. So your blood should be red blood for four days. It should be red and oxygenated. How is a baby going to thrive in stale brown blood? It's not. It can't. It should be red. Red, bright, red, healthy blood like when you cut your hand. Oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood small or no clots and you know they are the pain when I first started talking to women about this <laughs> I can remember talking to 380 WI women in a hall once and I said how many women have period pain thinking most of them would put their hand up and only a few do a lot of women go through life with just the odd tummy grumble they're not crippled so when we're told that period pain is normal, forget it, it's not normal, it's a sign that something's wrong. So large blood clots could be prevented using vitamin C and E together with evening primrose and fish oil because together they have oestrogenic properties and certain oestrogens produce changes in blood clotting. Obviously you don't want to use high doses and especially if you're on the pill or HRT or some hormone like Zolodex because, because they're estrogenic they could stop the pill working. But you could take lower normal doses and see if it stops the blood clotting. Usually fish oils are the best at that. Painful periods, if the blood is a bit like melted chocolate and coffee grinds and sludge and it has black tarry bits in it for seven to ten days something is not right you ha may have excruciating pain like your ovaries are being twisted the blood may be extremely heavy or flooding it's like turning a tap on whoosh and if you're unable to work 
or you're passing out or vomiting or crawling on the floor, something is not right. Take your husband, your mother, your friend, go to a GP and insist upon a referral to a specialist endometriosis gynaecologist. We don't want it to get worse, we want it to get better. This is not normal, this is in no way normal, so seek help and get someone to listen. Cysts. This is research Carlton Fredericks and Guy Abrahams at UCLA in Los Angeles. Excess dairy intake in eggs are felt from research to trigger cysts in some women. They use Mormon women as controls and the research showed that B vitamins aid the ovaries to control excess estrogen but sugars reduce the ability of the B vitamins to work. There's also some research, I looked for it last night and can't find it, I couldn't find the book unless I know it's in, but there was some re research showing high copper levels were linked to ovarian cyst formation. Copper is estrogenic, so there is some research suggesting that. So you've got this wonderful object called an ovary the size of a walnut or an almond in its shell and in your brain you have a pituitary gland which sends FSH down to the ovary and on the outside core you've got 400,000 eggs when you're a teenager. As a fetus you've got 7 million or a bit like a goldfish. So every month this FSH comes and tells some of these tightly packed eggs to start maturing and two or three of them begin to grow and around each over you've got two million granulosa cells which are taking nutrients from the bloodstream. Gynaecologists in Argentina sh showed last year that the ovary is the only organ in the body with a double bloodstream. So the egg's maturing, it takes about three months. Once it becomes 22 centimetres, the others reabsorb and that one keeps growing. Then halfway through your cycle, luteinizing hormone comes and ruptures the membrane and you get Mittelschmerz. <gasps> you can feel, some people can tell when it's happening. And a little bit of blood comes out and then that membrane seals over and becomes the golden body the corpus luteum that produces progesterone for the next 12 weeks if you're pregnant until the placenta takes over. So it's quite magical really. And then the egg and sperm meet somewhere here. It takes them seven to nine days to roll back into the womb. And then when you watch it on a camera, the little blastocyst, it's very fussy. It rolls around on the endometrium trying to find where to implant to build a placenta. I think it's looking for a nutrient rich spot. And then it takes another, I should say, it takes another 10 days to build the placenta. So it's quite magical and quick. Pain and inflammation, blood vessels dilate, the blood flow increases, everything goes red and inflamed if you've cut your hand or burnt you on the oven. You know what this is like. You get histamine release, PGE2, histamine tightens. So all of these spots of endo are triggering pain. And research shows that C, E, vitamin K, zinc, selenium, essential fatty acids, B1, B6, B12, magnesium and DLPA all help to reduce pain. They're needed in the body's pain mechanism. This is all going on my website, so you'll yeah, be able to. Yeah. C E K. Thank you very much. Zinc, selenium, oils, B, and magnesium. So, if you're eating lots of vegetables, nuts, and seeds, you're getting prostaglandin series two, which reduces inflammation. If you're eating oily fish, walnut, and linseed, you get alpha linolenic acid which produces P prostaglandin series 3, which also reduces inflammation and stops blood clotting. If you're eating lots of meat and dairy, you're getting prostaglandin series 2, which triggers inflammation. 
So you need to eat far more vegetables and fish and cut down the meat and dairy. And research, the first, <laughs> the first piece of research I ever found was on bunny rabbits with endometriosis induced and when they gave the bunny rabbits fish oil the endometriosis implant shrank and Danish women <coughs> they showed that omega-3 fatty acids and a higher ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 was associated with reduced menstrual pain so again the oily fish nuts and seeds green veg olive oil walnut oil are the important things to have and vitamin C inhibits secretion of the prostaglandins which trigger inflammation. Vitamin E reduces muscle cramps and pains in the lower back and it also protects lysome membranes from histamine damage and serotonin damage. So there is research showing what they do. <coughs> when B12 is taken with vitamin B1 and B6, they produce significant dose-dependent pain relief and inhibit inflammation, comparable to standard analgesic treatments. And proanthocyanidins, the ones in berries, grapeseed, pine bark, pycnogenol, red wine, are also anti-inflammatory. They increase vitamin C levels in cells and stop capillary wall leakage and help stop free radical damage. The thing that worries me, and I always say to people, be careful, is that if you're getting a lot of pain and you take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, they deplete the body of folic acid and iron. So you need to make sure they're in your diet or you're taking a supplement to cover it. Oral contraceptive pills, because I'm getting girls of 23 who've been on the pill since they were 10 years old, they're depleting the body of folic acid, B2, B6, B12, C, magnesium and zinc. So in America, the Yasmin pill, they've started adding nutrients to it. So I think if you're struggling, you should be perhaps taking a low dose, good quality multivitamin to make sure you're stopping this depletion. Now obviously we can get, do our best to get people as healthy as we can, but you can't do anything with food and nutrients unless the bowel's healthy, because every tissue in the body is fed by the bloodstream and supplied by the bowel. So if the bowel's not working and it's dirty, <coughs> the blood's also not going to work and the organs and tissues are not going to work. So you've got to treat digestion first. And you've got two to four pounds of healthy bacteria living in your small intestine. You scratch my back, we feed them, we give them water, and in return they produce B vitamins and vitamin K that help on the gut membrane to produce 10 to the power of 10 immunoglobulin producing cells per meter of small bowel. <coughs> Excuse me, so 80% of the immunoglobulin cells in the body are produced if your gut flora and your bowel are healthy. It's like the atmosphere around planet Earth. If that goes, we're dead. If your healthy gut flora starts failing, your immune system starts failing. And we know that antibiotics and some of the hormone treatments and non-steroidal and aspirin can disrupt gut flora. So an acid offers. I did tear stool samples on a few hundred women and we found a lot were gluten sensitive, had low beneficial bacteria, a quarter had yeast overgrowth, about half had got resistant yeast, three quarters antibiotic resistance. So you've got this link between the immune and digestive system. Healthy gut flora produces B vitamins for the gut membrane. The gut membranes producing 80% of the immunoglobulins. The immunoglobulins are needed to fight infection. So you've got this continuous link going on. And it's very important that you have healthy gut flora because the acidophilus helps to reduce the reabsorption of excreted detoxified estrogen. 
and if you're having enough soluble fibre like pectin in fruit, arginate in seaweed, oat bran, vegetables, nuts and seeds, then that soluble fibre can absorb the degraded oestrogen and cholesterol and take it out of the body. But if your healthy gut flora isn't healthy and you're not eating the right sorts of fibre, the bad oestrogen can keep circulating. I've done that. So control of oestrogen needs B vitamins. <laughs> if you're not having enough protein or you're having too much sugar, that can upset that process. So every cell in your body is producing oestrogen, your ovaries and your adrenals. And it's in a form, there are several forms, but to simplify it, the main one is oestradiol. When you're having enough B vitamins and your liver enzymes and your gut flora are healthy, it's changed to estriol and that will bind to the fibre so you can excrete it properly. An excess wheat and soy put up estrogen, excess citrus, vitamin C, high doses, folic acid, Korean ginseng, PCBs, dioxins and the hormones in meat and dairy. If you're not having enough fibre, if you're having not enough protein and too little B vitamins, that can all disrupt your oestrogen balance. So green, leafy, anything. And there is research showing that vegetarian diets, women who are vegetarian, excrete two to three times more oestrogen in their stools and have 50% lower oestrogen in their blood compared to meat eaters. So high fibre, meaning the soluble fibre, the gentle fibres, not the wheat, may help explain lower PMS symptoms as excess oestrogen binds to the soluble fibre to be excreted. So the Brussels sprouts, cabbage, indole 3 carbinol prevents this receptor binding of stronger oestrogens. So this eating more veg for endometriosis is a crucial thing. I, don't, I think I've just done that. We've also got Philippe Connix in Belgium, a good gynaecologist, who's looked at the incidence of endometriosis in women at his clinics. There they've got infertility of 60 to 80 percent. And they looked at the dioxin concentrations in breast milk. They're the highest in the world apart from the Great Lakes. And the association between endometriosis and PCBs was first suggested in 1992 when we found some monkeys that had been fed them. So you need meat and dairy food should be free of synthetic hormones and pesticides. In the atmosphere the pesticides come from incinerators and factories. So you've got to try and avoid them. They concentrate in fat cells. So cutting down on full cream milk and high fat, like butter, cheese and meat, reducing processed food as there are hidden trans fats. The question with a nutritionist is what do we do about fish? Is there any unpolluted water anywhere on the planet? One piece of research suggests you need to peel vegetables as dioxins can stick to the outer surface. But, you know, but it's you need, very you difficult. Need them, no? For the fibre? Well, yes. I know, this is a nightmare, isn't it? So breakfast, people come to me and they're having cereal, toast, milk, jam, tea, chocolate and coffee for mid-morning snack, cheese sandwich and cake for lunch, tea and biscuits mid-afternoon, pizza, Coca-Cola, ice cream and crisps. So what's wrong with that? <laughs> well, one, two... Three, four, five, six, seven, seven lots of wheat for a start. So I'm suggesting that for breakfast we have a fruit smoothie, a herb tea, some nuts and some water for snack, salmon salad, some fruit and tea with lemon to help your digestion at lunch, oat and nut bar and something like water or some elderflower cordial. And then dinner, chicken in lemon sauce, some broccoli, a grilled tomato, new potatoes and rice, berries and cream fraiche. So tip your 
thinking on its head and try and get more nutrients. Where are the nutrients in there? Not a lot. So go to the food where your nutrients are dense and make sure you're eating more healthy food. Um, I'll skip that because I've mentioned it. Antioxidant nutrients, selenium A, C and E, CoQ10, taurine, cysteine, glutathione, copper, manganese, zinc, iron and riboflavin. They're all known to quench free radical damage. And women with endo are more likely to have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, musculosclerosis. Chronic fatigue syndrome is a hundred times more likely. Fibromyalgia twice as likely. Hyperthyroidism seven times more likely. And as I said, the asthma, allergies and eczema and hay fever. So the poisoned apple <laughs> needs labelling. So one man's meat is another man's poison. If you feel a food is upsetting you, the best thing to do is exclude it from your diet every day for a month and see if that makes you feel better. Coffee and citrus obviously a major gut irritant, so if you're getting diarrhea, those are the first things to go. And also orange and grapefruit, there's a chemical in them which upsets estrogen clearance in the liver and obviously chemicals that you don't need. Oestrogen and thyroxine are antagonistic hormones, so if your oestrogen's high, it can push thyroid down. So we get lots of women with thyroid type symptoms, hair loss, low thyroid, weight gain. So you've got to be careful with goitrogenic foods and only eat them if they're cooked. There is a lot of research showing that women diagnosed with celiac disease may fall pregnant, but they have reduced rates of miscarriage. Men can have reduced sperm count. And it should be tested for. If you have endometriosis I would, and you're struggling to get pregnant, you need to get checked for celiac and thyroid disease. Now, if you're wheat intolerant, then you can have oats, they've got avenin in. You can avoid wheat, rye, barley, spelt, camut, but you can eat rice, corn, buckwheat, quinoa, millet, tapioca, arrowroot, chestnut and banana flour. If you're having a problem, I've lost it, the dairy. If you're a problem with dairy, then avoid bovine dairy first, cow's milk, and try using goat, sheep and buffalo. If they still upset you, get try and get your doctor to do a lactose intolerance test. But you could use soya milk, rice, oat, almond, hazelnut or coconut milk for the time being. So health. Breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper. Try and have your main meal at breakfast and lunch and not have such a big meal in the evening. Make them unhurried. Rushing around with a sandwich is not good news. Have healthy snacks like nuts and seeds and fruit. Shop frequently. It's no good going to the supermarket with your trolley, pushing it round the aisles, filling it up with a week's supply. You put it all in the bottom of the fridge and six days later, five days later, the vitamins have gone into outer space. They're in Alpha Centauri. So you need your veg every two days. My grandma, think of grandmas. They shopped every other day so things were fresher. Unrefined cold pressed oils like extra virgin olive oil Fresh water, you know, a few tumblers of water a day. Choose organic or pasture fed meat so that you're trying to avoid the ones with hormones in or pellet fed. And try and eat like your grandma, hunter gatherers. So enjoy your fruit and veg, green leafy, red coloured veg, roots and tubers, raw fresh fruit, especially berries because they help reduce inflammation, the proanthocyanidins. 
your white and oily deep sea fish two or three times a week about three ounces um, organic lean meat organic eggs maybe tofu maybe not snack on nut seeds corn tacos poppadoms fruits crudités so nutrient rich food try to keep chocolate and sweets for birthdays christmas anniversaries easter bunnies wheat i see 80 percent of women with endo have wheat problems bovine dairy coffee alcohol fizzy drinks aspartame and msg red meat use organic only pasture fed meat so lamb would be a good one hidden trans fats avoid edible foods like substances i love michael pullen's books where he's talking about edible like food substances made in laboratories be careful of them i don't want to do that because i have time if you need supplements a multivitamin mineral low or no vitamin a 2000 ius only an evening primrose and fish oil one to two thousand milligrams something like ephemerine which they have here a magnesium up to 200 or 300 milligrams which will help relax smooth muscle which is the bowel and the uterus muscle and help you sleep and calm nerves if you can get it from your food good if you're bleeding from your bowel and your guts disrupted then you need to do something else and an acidophilus four billion those would be the basic four things to try for a couple of months to see if it helps if like me you were bleeding from your bowel the old-fashioned slippery elm bark tablets help to coat the gut membrane with a nutrient rich gel so that you it, you're giving it time to heal a digestive enzyme if you've got thrush caprylic acid powdarco or biocyadin and you may want vitamin c about 500 milligrams and if you've got very low backache or you've got adhesions where everything is stuck together vitamin e may help and there is research on proanthocyanidins and turmeric to reduce inflammation. I see people at the endometriosis and fertility clinic here in London for an hour and I always use the MIMOC 2, a medical clinical audit from Medical Research Council. So I see people for about an hour and a quarter. Then I follow up a month later with half an hour looking at tests sweat analysis, lactose, gluten intolerance, hormone profiles. If we can get the doctors to do them, that's the best. So you have this MIMOC clinical audit, which I do with every patient I see, and you can see that the ones when they come off wheat, their scores reduce down. And 198 women over six months reported an average 50% reduction in pain scores. 34% reported infertility as a problem. 52% of this subfertile group fell pregnant. They were between 35 and 47 years of age. Some of them had failed IVF. 26% <laughs> of the women who weren't trying to get pregnant got pregnant. It wasn't my fault. And 82% reported reverse adverse <coughs> reactions from eating wheat when they reintroduced it after a month. And 52% reported adverse reactions when they went back onto cow's dairy. Again, another group of 100 women, over three months, 93% reported a reduction in pain, 85% after six months. 41% had infertility of, as a problem and 25% of that group fell pregnant and 11.8% fell pregnant who weren't trying and 70% said they had a problem when they ate wheat again and 66% with dairy. So laughter is supposed to help and there is research at Harvard and Yale showing that when you're laughing it improves your white blood cell count so it improves your immune system
and Lynn in Scotland, my message is simple, healing through nutrition works. Thanks to Diane, I have what everyone wants. I have my life back and so much hope for my future. The Endometriosis She Trust, the easiest way to get to me is Silver Oaks Farm, Waldron, Heathfield, East Sussex, TN21 ORS. If you send a stamped addressed A5 envelope, we'll send you some of our free leaflets in the post. And do join us. There's my book, which is here, Endometriosis, the key to healing through fit and fertility through nutrition. I've distilled all the nutrition research into a little booklet, which has got a DVD on case histories with eight women telling you how nutrition helped them. Oh, and I'm, I'm going to stop there. The clinic here is 0207 631 So it's makingbabies.com or endometriosis.co.uk. And this is Endometriosis Awareness Week. So talk if you have endometriosis, Go to your local radio station or your local paper and give them a case study and try and let us get more publicity this week. Thank you, everybody. Thank so, you.